the Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. Hello, and welcome to Short Circuit, your podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeals. I'm your host, Anthony Sanders, director of the Center for Judicial Engagement at the Institute for Justice. We're recording this on Tuesday, November 9th, 2021. And today is a special short circuit. We have a very special guest joining us, Professor Fred Smith of Emory Law. And joining him is IJ attorney Sam Gedge. We'll get to both of these gentlemen in a moment when they will provide much more education and entertainment than I'm capable of. But first, to set the stage, if you've been listening to this podcast over the course of 2021, you know it's been a year of anniversaries when it comes to civil rights. First in April, in a special live event, we celebrated the 150th anniversary of the adoption of the Ku Klux Klan Act and what came to be known as Section 1983, the Reconstruction Congress's attempt to give everyone a cause of action against state officials who violate federal constitutional rights. Then, in an episode of our sister podcast, Bound by Oath, we celebrated the 60th anniversary of Monroe v. Pape, the Supreme Court ruling that revived Section 1983 and made it much more viable tool to realize its original promise of protecting civil rights. But along the way, there was another anniversary that we at the Center for Judicial Engagement haven't recognized until now. That's the 1971 decision of Younger v. Harris. However, unlike the other two anniversaries, for some of us, this doesn't mean it's exactly a time to celebrate, but instead to reflect on something that may have gone wrong and how we can fix that in the future. To extremely simplify things, Younger versus Harris recognized a way for federal courts to not decide federal claims when the state already had filed a case against the plaintiff. It essentially based its decision on two words, both of which oddly begin in the opinion with capital letters, our federalism. Today, we're going to get to the roots of this our federalism, what happened in Younger, its later evolution, how Younger today has stymied needed reforms, and what the future holds. Now, one of our guests for our Section 1983 birthday party was Professor Smith, and he's also appeared on this season's Bound by Oath. So I'm very happy to welcome back for a third time to our Center for Judicial Engagement's listening audience, Professor Fred Smith of Emory. Among many other accolades, he's a graduate of Harvard College and Stanford Law, and not only has he achieved a hat trick for our audiovisual productions, but with federal clerkships, having clerked at the district appellate and Supreme Court level. Fred, thanks so much for coming back on and joining us for yet another anniversary. Always a pleasure to be here. Uh, any, any time to talk about Fed courts is uh, it's a good occasion. Fabulous. Well, we're going to start with Sam. Uh, Sam Gedge, who is a litigator at the Institute for Justice, the brainchild behind this episode. And he's also a massive fan of Rumpel of the Bailey. Uh, I don't know if that's going to come up at all, but I wanted to point it out. Sam, I believe you're going to give us a case brief of sorts of Younger versus Harris. Maybe it's best if you start off who were Mr. Younger and his fellow plaintiffs and what were they doing in federal court? Sure. Um, so uh, John Harris Jr. Um, was, I believe, a labor organizer and activist in late 1960s California. Um, and he was in federal court because he wanted to vindicate his federal rights. Um, most of us would think that that's the right place to go if you want to get that kind of thing done. Um, but it turns out that that Mr. Harris and his co-plaintiffs were, were out of luck um, with the birth of the, the younger abstention doctrine. Um, so I guess just to, to start off with a, a very little bit of background about what the case was about, um, California in the 1960s uh, had a law called the Criminal Syndicalism Act, um, which sounds kind of scary, but the way it was enforced is that they would criminally prosecute people whose politics they didn't like for doing things like handing out um, leaflets that the, the powers that be thought were too socialist or that had communist undertones. Um, so John Harris Jr. was... Uh, charged uh, by uh, the Los Angeles district attorney uh, with violating this act for distributing leaflets. And his view was that this uh, this law violated the First Amendment because he had a First Amendment right to, uh, to distribute leaflets. So what he did was that he went to federal court and he asked for the federal court to hold that this act violated the First Amendment. Um, seems like a, a natural step. And the uh, federal district court agreed with him. Uh, held that the law was unconstitutional, said that the, the prosecutor couldn't prosecute him for, for violating it. 
And the prosecutor appealed directly to the U.S. Supreme Court, as was his right under the the rules in place in the the 1960s and 1970s. The prosecutor says, you know, U.S. Supreme Court, I want you to hold that this law uh, is fine. It doesn't violate the First Amendment. Uh, Mr. Harris and his co-plaintiffs, you know, appeared as respondents and said, you know, we want you to hold that uh, the law does violate the First Amendment. We want you to affirm the lower court's ruling. Um, kind of so far, so good. But where things really went off the rails is when the U.S. Supreme Court kind of ducked that merits question entirely and instead manufactured what we now know as, as younger abstention. Um, basically, the, the court heard the appeal, I think, two times. They, they set it for a re-argument, which is a really rare procedural device, and effectively ventured far beyond the merits arguments that the parties had teed up and said that uh, the federal courts, in fact, shouldn't have entertained the First Amendment challenge to begin with. Um, so I'm happy to kind of talk about, you know, why that doesn't make a whole lot of sense and why the decision has a lot of problems with it. Um, but I, I'm happy to let let either of you chime in if, if that sparks any thoughts for you. Yeah, um, it does. So, you know, I um, the way that you just told the story is the way that I've always told the story and thought of the story. Um a friend of mine who does civil rights litigation and was also recently on a podcast about younger abstention at 50, believe it or not, um, uh, gave me a little bit more background, um, which is that uh, at the time, as John Harris, as you know, he was a, a labor organizer, um, but he was uh, specifically he was organizing individuals after the shooting of an uh, of a unarmed black man uh, in Watts and some unrest that followed. Uh, the unarmed man was uh, was taking his wife um, to the hospital. Um, she was pregnant, uh, and somehow that escalated uh, into him being dead. Um, and so, uh, and so those were the circumstances in which uh, John Harris was uh, organizing. And um, you know, I was never taught that in Fed courts, but I think in this moment that we're in, um, you know, it's, uh, I mean, if I had known that when I wrote about younger abstention, I certainly would have included it. Um, uh, because I, I, I think it, um, it helps us appreciate even more the humanity uh, behind uh, these captions um, and the stakes. Yeah, a- absolutely. Um, and I mean, I, I'll just put in a plug for for your law review article, Professor Smith. Um, I I'm a big fan of abstention, um, and I think that your your law review article, abstention in the time of Ferguson, really is just a, a fantastic piece. Um, I, I've read it I think three times, so it's um, just a, a really fantastic work on you know how how abstention should work. To clarify, I believe when you say you're a big fan of abstention, you're not huge fan of federal courts just abstaining all the time for whatever reason. It's that it's an interesting subject. Yes, a- absolutely. Um, a huge fan of law review articles explaining how abstention can be curtailed. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. What well, one one Pete, Pete background uh, on the case that I just find bizarre is: isn't it true that this is the same law that decades ago the court had found unconstitutional in California, or it was a, it was a related? Yeah, law? so I don't, I don't, um, I don't know if aspects of this law have been declared unconstitutional, but it is remarkable that it happened so shortly after Brandenburg. Um, where a very similar law from Ohio um, had been declared unconstitutional, right? Suggesting that if they had gotten to the merits, um, this particular law um, that um, that prohibited the encouragement of uh, any criminal activity that, among other things, might lead to um, to political change, um, it, it, it seems quite certain that the law on the merits would have been um, declared unconstitutional at that particular moment. Uh, But the court, of course, didn't get to the merits. Now, after uh, after Younger, we have this issue comes up again in a few different kinds of guises, not an actual prosecution. What is the evolution uh, after that? uh, And where where does it then end up a couple decades later? If either of you want to jump in. I mean, I, I can kind of give a, a, a thumbnail sketch. Um, so, yeah, I mean, kind of the, the core holding of Younger was that, um, you know, if you're being prosecuted in state court under a law that you think violates your federal rights, like your First Amendment rights, for example, um, you cannot go to the federal courts to get relief. You basically have to slug it out in state court and maybe get the U.S. Supreme Court to grant review if you actually want a federal judge to pass on that federal issue. Um, you know, the, the, the case, I think, even for its time was pretty suspect. 
um, for, for a variety of reasons that we can talk about. Um, but it really did kind of take on a life of its own over the next 10 or 15 years in the 70s and 80s. Um, you know, it, it went from, you know, the federal courts have to surrender jurisdiction, have to abstain in criminal prosecutions, and then it expanded to, well, some kinds of civil, civil enforcement proceedings, uh, local nuisance actions, state administrative proceedings. So it really starts ballooning, um, which I think is kind of, honestly, kind of an an understandable consequence, you know, it, it, it was a it was and continues to be a doctrine that's, you know, untethered from statutory text, untethered from constitutional text. Um, it's entirely judge made. And it it was a really kind of appealing docket clearing device, I think, for the Supreme Court in the 70s and 80s, which was a time when, you know, there was an incredible amount of pressure on the court because they had a, you know, an overwhelming, you know, mandatory jurisdiction docket. Um, so I think that this was just a natural kind of release valve for them to kind of get cases off of their desk. And, and they reacted to that by just expanding this really kind of amorphous doctrine to kick federal plaintiffs out of federal court. Yeah. And so, as you know, right, it expanded to some civil proceedings, it expanded to a certain types of uh, judicial enforcement actions. And, um, and it also um, extended to, it, it, the court made clear that it applied not only to injunctions, but it also applied to declaratory relief. Um, and the court, um, said that younger abstention sometimes applies even if there's not an action pending, uh, a criminal action pending against the person at the time that the federal suit is filed. So if someone files a federal suit and then later that day or the next day the person's arrested, then younger abstention applies then too. Um, so all of these were expansions of younger abstention um, that took place predominantly in the 1970s um, and uh, and then some of the uh, expansions happened a little bit later. Um, you know, <clears throat> it's... It's important, I think, to younger abstention. We call it younger abstention because uh, I think um, it, the the language is just so emphatic in this particular case. Um, but the question of when one could um, initiate a federal action um, uh, to challenge a criminal law and to uh, stay uh, to to stop a a criminal prosecution, a state criminal prosecution, um, is a question as at least as old as Ex parte Young, right? Um, and, uh, and 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 I think it's helpful to um, to contextualize it that way to sort of kind of uh, appreciate that um, that this is this is a question that the court uh, wrestled with throughout um, throughout the 1900s. But younger makes it seem like it's exceptional. Like there's this language that you know that this is this extraordinary thing. Um, I do think that it's important to think about what are the circumstances in which it's okay um, for someone to go to federal court to challenge uh, a criminal state prosecution. Um, I do think that invites important federalism concerns. I mean, if someone um, were to file an exclusionary. Uh, a motion to exclude evidence in a state criminal prosecution, and then they lost. And every single time they were able to say, well, now I'm going to federal court. Or every time they had right. objection, you know, uh, hearsay, you know, uh, or confrontation <laughs> clause. And then they could just, and they could say, oh, well, you know, the federal court has my back over here. That would be tremendously disruptive. Um, but th but there's, a, there's a way in which Younger uh, treats this as this, um, as this kind of, this, this static um, uh, kind of barrier that it's almost impossible to overcome instead of treating it as a routine question around um, when is it okay to give injunctive relief? Um, it would irreparable harm happen in the absence of this? What are the interests of the state? You know, let's compare that to the interest of this particular party. All the things that federal courts typically do in, in, in injunctions and instead elevates this one component Right. The fact that there's an ongoing criminal prosecution and that's sufficient to defeat everything else. It's sufficient. It doesn't matter how strong the person's claims are on the merits. It doesn't matter how much irreparable harm the person will suffer. It doesn't matter how much when we balance the equities, um, the, the, we, would, we would find that the plaintiff's interests are more significant. All the things that we as lawyers are, and, uh, in particular are accustomed to, to thinking about when we think about in, injunctions, they get displaced. Um, by this, by this, this barrier with this, uh, with this kind of, you know, almost mythical language about uh, about the role of, uh, of federalism throughout American history, um, and uh, and that's part of why it's special and part of why it's worth talking about. Well, and the case that the odd thing to me about, I mean, there's a lot of odd things about this opinion, but a very odd thing is Justice Black, the the, the author, 
says that there's this thing called our federalism, which which we need to be very wary of when federal courts get involved in in these issues. He has a capital O, capital F, our federalism. He doesn't cite to anything when he says that, but then he does cite to a few cases where he's like, well, we've said this before. And there, you know, I haven't gone and read all those cases, but it seems like that makes it sound like younger has always been the law. Whereas as you say, Professor Smith, there there was ex parte young at the beginning of, of the century, and then the courts just kind of, you know, did equity uh, in civil rights for for a number of decades. Um, do you, does it seem like that was out of whole cloth, or were things going in that direction? Perhaps I mean we usually think of them going in the other direction with Monroe versus Pape and other 1983 cases, but it's almost like it was plucked out of thin air, you know, for whatever reasons you guys were just talking about. And, and all of a sudden it's like, this is the way it's always been. Yeah. So <clears throat> Owen Fist has this theory um, that part of the problem actually is another case that we actually tend to celebrate called Dombrowski, um, which was a few years before younger, um, where uh, someone was allowed to challenge a prosecution in Louisiana. Um, the context was, um, that a minister uh, and lawyer and some other civil rights uh, activists um, were being routinely um, harassed by the police. And they would be arrested and then they would say, you know, this is violates the First Amendment. And the cases would be thrown out, but time and again, they would get arrested. And so they, they went to federal court and the federal court said, and uh, it was the Supreme Court said, ultimately, you know, under these circumstances where there's this kind of bad faith harassment, um, someone can go to um, someone can go to federal court, but that, but they too use language that made it seem more exceptional than it might have been. Um, and, you know, and Owen Fist says in some respects, um, Dombrowski sowed the seeds of its own demise because when you get to younger, you know, they say that, oh, well, we have this, we have this one little case Dombrowski from a few years ago, but, but, but this is very different. Um, you know, and so, uh, you know, one scholar has this, this wonderful article, the, the cases that um, that Dombrowski forgot, <laughs> um, which are all <laughs> of these cases. Um, and, and I talk about it in some of my article, too. Um, but all of, all of these cases where the Supreme Court had allowed um, the challenging of, uh, of state uh, prosecutions um, uh, in uh, to go forward in a federal court. And it, at least when there were. Uh, there was grave irreparable harm that would otherwise befall the plaintiff. Um, and I think that it's important for that to be a, 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 a lodestar when trying to figure out whether or not to apply this doctrine. One thing, and I think just building off of that, one thing that struck me about you know, the kind of Younger's reasoning, you, you mentioned, Anthony, that you hadn't looked at the cases Younger cited, and I skimmed a few of them this this morning. Um, and a lot of them are from like the 20s and 30s and 40s. And they, they just evince this real kind of hostility towards and, and real discomfort with just the entire notion of pre-enforcement challenges in federal court at all. Like most of them, in fact, didn't involve federal court challenges to pending prosecutions. They just involved like a Jehovah's Witness, for example, saying, you know, I want to distribute leaflets. There's this law in the books saying I need a license. I don't have a license and I'm worried I'll get prosecuted. Um, and the Supreme Court basically said, no, you might have a valid First Amendment defense, but you get to Go violate that law, go get prosecuted and go defend yourself the next few years in state court and then we'll hear you maybe. Um, and may maybe that was kind of how the Supreme Court viewed pre-enforcement litigation in the 20s and 30s and 40s. I'm not really sure. Um, but that's certainly not how we view kind of civil rights litigation today or in recent decades, right? Like we, we take for granted that, of course, like ordinarily, of course, there should be the opportunity for pre-enforcement challenges when you're talking about like laws that chill First Amendment rights, for example. Um, you know, like, the, just as, an, as a kind of topical example, like the, the SB8 litigation, right? You know, the parties, everybody disagrees about different parts of that, but it seems to be common ground among the parties and among really the, the Supreme Court. It seems that like the, the, the presumption should be that pre-enforcement federal review is ordinarily available. And Younger just seems to be this kind of like last gasp, you know, uh, kind of a contrary view that was really kind of skeptical of the entire, you know, enterprise of, of pre-enforcement federal involvement. Yeah. So, um, but on that score, right. So this isn't, uh, so the, 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 I'm glad you said this because it, it highlights how in Younger versus Harris, you have two sets of plaintiffs. 
So, uh, so you have John Harris, and that's not pre-enforcement, right? He's actually, in fact, been arrested. And then, though, to your point, you do have another set of plaintiffs who filed at the same time who were doing much the same work uh, that John Harris was doing. They were, uh, they were organizers in the same context, um, in the same county. Um, and, uh, and, and they uh, were also suing. And for them, right, this was pre-enforcement because they had not yet been arrested. And, uh, and Younger Abstention says about those plaintiffs, oh, well, they haven't been arrested yet. They are filing this just based on the feeling, uh, and, and they may not use the word feeling, so I don't, I don't want to be too glib, but um, based on um, the fear um, uh, that they may, in fact, one day be prosecuted. Um, and so they don't have standing yet, right? Um, and so at the same time that they say, uh, John Harris, you, have, <laughs> you, you can't file your suit because you've been arrested, you have an ongoing criminal prosecution. They simultaneously say, and your uh, your co your co compatriots here, who you've been organizing with, um, they they don't have standing at all. Um, and uh, you know, I there's there's an art. I have like a long list of things I want to write, <laughs> but but one <laughs> but one thing I want to write is specifically about this timing issue, um, and about how. Um, Courts sometimes will assume, uh, or at least in their rhetoric, will, will, will state, and their reasoning will state, um, well, you know, this person, their case isn't quite ripe yet, you know, um, suggesting that, oh, well, down the line, there's a better time to bring it, right? But under these circumstances, if you wait until you've been prosecuted, then younger abstention arises. If you wait until you have been uh, found, say, not guilty, well, then your case is moot. Right. If you've said, oh, I want to I want to I want to challenge I want to challenge this now uh, so that this doesn't happen to anyone else. It's like, oh, no, no, you can't. You, you can't show this is likely to happen to you again. Your case is moot. If you're con if you are convicted, then the court says, oh, no, you've been convicted. We it, it would be uh, you now have a judgment against you. It would be deeply improper for us as a federal court to use Section 1983 to intervene. Your proper course is habeas, um, and you need to go through all of these other hoops in this other place. And so, um, and 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 I, I think it helps. Maybe I don't. I hope that's not too much of a course, but it, I think it's helpful to kind of paint this picture um, to show how at any given moment. Um, uh, there's another barrier, um, uh, mostly judge made, um, that comes to uh, make it difficult to file a federal civil rights suit um, when someone's constitutional rights have been violated. And so much of what you just said, I think today, for most federal judges, would seem pretty odd that you can't get that pre enforcement challenge. So you have a friend who's been arrested. You're doing the same thing. It seems like the local authorities are interested in enforcing this law. That's pretty um, run of the mill that you could you could file a pre enforcement challenge. Um, and so it's so odd that they're together in this in this one case. And I think what you were saying earlier about some of what was going on in the background in the country or locally um, might have fed into that. You know what otherwise just really doesn't make sense from from our vantage point today. It's, a, it's one of these, like, it's a remarkable time for fed courts uh, in the, night, the early 1970s. And, um, and uh, I think at the time, there were, including when on questions like pre-enforcement challenges, you know, the court understood itself to be a part of a common law tradition and process. Um, and, uh, you know, they would decide a case, then a year later, another case would get decided, and it would get refined over time. Um, I don't know that they understood themselves to be creating a doctrine that we would be talking about 50 years later calling younger abstention, right? I think sure. they understood themselves to be deciding uh, the case that was in front of them as the law was at that particular moment um, and as the law continued um, to develop. I mean, not to say that they didn't understand themselves to be developing the law in the process, um, as judges do, and, and they surely had constitutional values, including federalism, that were guiding them as they did so. But the um, but this kind of iconic status um, the, um, where where you know where people cited in a brief younger abstention right I don't I, I don't I, I'm not sure they understood themselves to be doing that and I think there's lots of reasons why we, we wound up there. Well, one thing uh, fast forward to 50 years uh, uh, later and what we're continuing to live with 
it, one thing that we are living with is the conti- the continued use of effectively a debtors' prisons, even though we thought those were outlawed a very long time ago in this country. So, um, Fred, tell us a little bit about your your work on that issue and how younger intersects with it um, with the the um, criminalization of poverty that we see in many court systems. Yeah, you know, so I'm embarrassed to say that um, that I this is an issue that. You know, I had not, not only had I not much thought about, but I, if you had talked to me six years or so ago or, or, or so, I, and you asked me what I thought about the state court system versus the federal court system, I mean, I would have cited to some articles about Bert Newborn and Erwin Chemerinsky and, 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 and William uh, Rubenstein, but I, um, but I, I wouldn't have had kind of a, a deep connection to um, to the question, and I probably would have assumed that state courts generally function well. Um, in the aftermath of Ferguson um, and the shooting of Michael Brown and the, the unrest that followed, um, my friend Alec Karakatsanis uh, was um, contemplating filing a suit there, which he ultimately did, not only in the, <clears throat> the town of Ferguson, but in also some of the other jurisdictions around it, um, around debtors' prisons, that is, uh, people being arrested because they couldn't af- afford to pay a fine or a fee, um, and uh, and then just sort of kind of being trapped in this in this cycle um, where, you know, sometimes they wouldn't show up because if they knew if they showed up, then they would get arrested for not paying, so then they have another charge of failure to appear, and it just kind of goes on and on and on. Um, and I, when I went there to sit in on interviews with him, I, have, I had no idea what I was going to to see. Um, and I was shocked. Um, I was shocked to meet uh, a woman who she had been an EMT and she had a traffic violation and uh, a fine um, that she uh, that she couldn't pay. And someone knocked on her door um, and they were from the, I can't remember what it was called, something like the traffic collection unit or something. And uh, and they arrested her, and she spent 48 days in jail, um, missing, in fact, her father's uh, funeral. And that was just one story. I mean, I could give many others. And uh, and and one of the things that was striking was just kind of how lawless it all felt. So, person after person described how you know the the the, the chief of police or someone would say, "Okay, now, well, all right, if you pay us, if you pay us two hundred dollars, then we'll let you out today." And and then uh, someone would overhear that and say, oh, well, what about us? And they'd be like, oh, no, you can pay more. Um, if, if you pay us 500, you, you still haven't called everybody you might be able to call. And it and, um, you know, one of one of one of the individuals um, brought me a copy of brought us a copy of their um, of their their notice to 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 go to court to pay. And the clerk of the court had marked out the words court date. And written in the word, in place of court, written the word pay for payday. And, uh, you know, the first time I heard, heard one of these stories, I, 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 won't say, I won't say I didn't believe it, but, you know, I mean, I entered with a healthy degree of skepticism as an academic um, and as a person with basic faith in our system. Um, and uh, as person after person told their story and they all were consistent with one another, I looked at Alec and I said, Alec, um, I won't say everything I said, but one thing I said was, um, you know, I, I teach fed courts with kind of a, a basic assumption that state courts are basically functioning. And at least here in this place, in this time, they are not. And, and I went from writing about what John's, John, James Madison thought about the guarantee clause to, to writing about this federalism doctrine um, that uh, that that potentially could have posed an existential threat to this line of litigation and was beginning to. And in abstention of the time of Ferguson, I write about some cases in which uh, younger abstention interrupted those cases. Fortunately, I will say that most younger abstention challenges have been rejected. Um, but it's something to keep an eye on. Um, about 15 uh, Fed Court scholars uh, co-signed a brief recently uh, 
um, for a debtor's prison um, case um, in the uh, in the Tenth Circuit, um, and um, and yeah, and so we're you know we're generally kind of keep keep keeping an eye on it, such that um, that when courts are applying it too aggressively, um, we're at least lending our voice um, to uh, to why they should. And when courts recently have been, and it's good to hear, rejecting younger abstention, have they been doing it because of that, the reasoning in younger, that if you don't have an effective way to challenge this, then, okay, then you can go to, in state court, then you can go to federal court. Is it on that recognition or is it more the the advocates are clever enough to have people who haven't quite been arrested yet or or what have you? So uh, it's a combination of things because it's important to remember that. So we can use this word debtor's prison in it, but it, it, there's different moments that it could capture, right? So um, sometimes that phrase is used in the context of bail, um, where there's a rigid bail schedule. Um, and that is in some ways a very different circumstance than when someone has a judgment against them and the different doctrines that kind of come up um, um, uh, vary. But I'll say that one of the most aggressive uses of Younger that, um, that I'm beginning to see some courts at least hint at um, the Fifth Circuit hinted at this during oral argument recently, is the idea that um, that even if you can't raise your constitutional claim in your current state case, that even if you can go and file in some other state suit this issue, um, then federal court should stay out. And that, that, that would be uh, uh, an extraordinary departure um, from a long tradition that the plaintiff uh, is the the master of the complaint and and gets to uh, you know pick their forum um, when it comes to where they file their civil rights suits um, uh, and so that that so that's that's something uh, to watch um, because that I mean that that would be an existential threat not only to debtors prison litigation but really any litigation that was attempting to um, to reform criminal state criminal justice. Uh, uh, regimes in federal court. Right. Cause I mean like the, I presumably like if, if that were the view of younger, it would just swallow the, the general rule, right? Because you can almost always bring federal claims in state court if you want to and people who want to do it, but other people don't want to. Um, and that they should have that opportunity. Exactly. Younger abstention would stop being exceptional, which is what it's supposed to be, right? The, I mean, the general rule is that it, uh, federal courts are supposed to entertain suits when they have jurisdiction. Right. So if someone if they have jurisdiction and someone has a cause of action uh, and um, and they have an injury, et cetera, then um, then the general rule I'm going back to, you know, I mean, we can cite, you know, Chief Justice Marshall um, for this proposition (laughs) um, is that federal courts have an obligation to hear the case Um, somewhere in the 1970s. They started saying they changed the word obligation to virtually unflagging obligation. But we'll we'll go with that. Right. Even that. Right. A virtually unflagging obligation. If one were to say that any time you can bring a suit somewhere in a state civil suit, then you can't come to federal court uh, in, under these circumstances, then that that's that would just completely abandon the virtually unflagging obligation the federal courts have um, to entertain suits when they have jurisdiction. Sam, you have uh, recently been in federal court um, arguing about younger in in some of your cases, and you have dove into some of these issues with excessive fines and and state court systems. What is your uh, feel for where the lay of the land is and what more uh, could be done? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think my most recent foray into Younger was, was you know, in an amicus brief. So I don't want to pretend that I was on the front line of, of that case. Um, but it, it certainly seems to be the case that, you know, the Supreme Court seems to have lost a lot of interest and sympathy for Younger. I think the last time the Supreme Court exercised Younger abstention or, or affirmed a lower court's exercise, I think was in 1987. So for like more more of Younger's life than not, the Supreme Court seems to have had like no no love for Younger. Um, but I think the same is not true of the lower courts because much like you know the Supreme Court in the 70s and 80s, the lower courts are you know awash in litigation. They're they're always looking for reasons to to try to to get cases off of their docket if they can. Um, and Younger is kind of an a, a tempting tool for for doing that. So you see. 
um, lower courts kind of doing what the Supreme Court was doing in the 70s, namely kind of trying to push the envelope more and more. Um, saw that in the Fifth Circuit, I think in a case that Professor Smith talked about in his article uh, involving a challenge to you know public defender fees. Um, you see it in a lot of cases. And, and the unfortunate thing is that a lot of these cases involve, you know, unsophisticated litigants, whether they're pro se or whether they're low income. Um, and they're basically just getting shunted out of federal court on on these really kind of convoluted Byzantine abstention doctrines. Um, you know, and not infrequently, the the doctrines are raised by the court sua sponte. Um, so you see in the Ninth Circuit and recently in the Seventh Circuit, the government isn't even arguing for abstention. Sometimes they're effectively waiving it um, when asked. And the, the courts are still saying, you know what, well, we're going to we're going to kick it anyway. And you know, it's not fair to the litigants. Um, it, it's not good for you know the predictability of the rule of law. You know, it, it really muddies an area that should be clear, namely, you know, what kind of jurisdictional rules govern when you can get into federal court. Um, and so, you know, m- my hope is that the Supreme Court will will do what it has done in recent decades when it confronts you know doctrines like Younger and like Rooker Feldman, and you know. Pump the brakes, basically. Um, you know, in 2006, I think it was uh, Justice Ginsburg in an uh, Exxon Mobil case said, you know, Rooker Feldman, the, uh, another kind of Baroque, uh, effectively a st- abstention doctrine, you know, has kind of gone off the rails in the lower courts. They did the same thing with Younger in 2013. Um, but I think they just kind of need to need to keep doing that um, and really kind of driving home that there are limits to these doctrines and that the presumption should be that you know people with federal claims, uh, you know, have the right to federal court protection if they want it. Let's circle back to, to something uh, that Fred said earlier in our conversation, which I think is right at the, the heart of this matter, which is we have this problem that Section 1983, this, the cause of action people are trying to use in most of these cases, is pretty broad, uh, a violation of, of your constitutional rights. You can go to federal court. And yet, you know, what if a confrontation clause challenge fails at trial and you can go to federal court every time something like that happens? and that can't be right. What the Reconstruction Congress was was asking for in every case across the country, um, we we couldn't have that. The, the, the state and federal court systems wouldn't work, and so there has to be some kind of middle ground. The problem is right. There's a vast amount of territory there for where the, the the middle ground is. How do how do you see the right fit being? Whether working within the context of Younger, or even if the Supreme Court just wants to wash its hands of Younger and come up with something that makes more sense. Um, where, where would you put that? Yeah. So, you know, what I've argued is that when it comes to systemic and structural constitutional violations, um, that that invites the type of irreparable harm that should cause the Supreme Court that should cause federal courts to intervene. And um, and, if, and part of why I make that argument is that I think it's completely consistent with what the Supreme Court at least has said. And, and, as, uh, and as Sam pointed out, sometimes when this gets into the lower courts, um, it kind of goes into some other directions. Um, but, um, but, you know, but, you know if, a, if there's a systemic or structural constitutional violation um, that's, in, that's actually affecting the state court process, then I think it's fair to say under those circumstances that there's a plausible argument, at least, that the, um, that the state system is not adequate. Um, and so that's, um, that's what I've argued. You know, if I were um, kind of like, you know, just kind of starting from scratch, um, which I guess as a professor, you kind of always are, right? <laughs> like you're not, you're not, you're not bound uh, in a way that you would be if you were a judge. Um, you know, I, I think the direction I'm, I'm about to start moving is more toward just kind of treating these injunctions just like we would any other. Um, and that's where I started, right? So just, you know, like there, it's not to say that, that so the concern that you just raised and uh, about kind of a constant interruption of the federal, uh, of, of by federal courts into state court proceedings that way, um, you know, that's an important and weighty interest. And it should be when you, when the court, just like in any other uh, in, in context where there's, uh, where someone's filing for equitable relief, it should be one of the really important interests that the court takes into account. Um, but there should also be room um, for thinking about what it means from the perspective of irreparable harm for a woman to spend 48 days in jail um, with uh, in some of the most, and I mean, and not to make this a jail condition issue, but I mean, she, the conditions were, were horrid. Um, what, is, what does that mean? I mean, and when someone is arrested and they're detained, 
um, you know, I think that I was kind of guilty of, uh, of thinking, oh, well, they were there for, you know, a few days, right? I mean, I, I don't, I don't think because I've, because I've never been close enough to the system to imagine myself, um, as one of the people who is there for a few days. And, I've, and, I've, and, but, but what it means for someone, especially someone who doesn't have a lot of money, um, is that that's time that they are not working. That's time that they're not going to be able to spend time with their kids. It's time that because they're not working um, as a, you know, on their job as a painter or, you know, or, or, or some other hourly wage um, or daily wage that they can't afford to pay their rent. It may, could mean eviction. Um, it could mean that they're, that they're dealing with childcare issues. Anyway, so I like, um, but there's not, there's not really, there needs to be much more room to think about that. Right. Um, to think about the irreparable harm, to think about the federalism harm as well, to weigh them and to think about how well the, the whether or not there's the person's likely to succeed on the merit. So does this person have an actual valid claim? Right. So if, if the claim isn't meritorious, you know, you kick it out at an early stage. Um, but if if the person actually has a strong claim on the merits, that should matter too. Again, just like it matters in all other contexts for equitable relief. Um, and, um, and and that, that, so that, that's what I, that would be my recommendation. In, in a funny way, the way you just described that situation makes it sound like what the woman needed was a writ of habeas corpus. Not like the way we do habeas today and how it's structured and, and ADAP and, and all that. But the the original kind of English understanding of what a writ of habeas corpus was, which is you are being detained unlawfully, you go to a to a judge who can get you out of there. Um, and I'm not saying that that would be <laughs> the best way to go a, a, at all. It's just it that makes sense that you could get that kind of relief versus you know being stuck in this um, uh, in, in this rule that that younger set up for us. And sometimes that's the way that litigants go, um, in at least in state habeas regimes where it makes sense. Um, so, uh, so there was a case recently in California um, that overturned California's bail system as we know it. Um, that case was brought not as a Section 1983 suit. Um, it was brought in the context of a state habeas proceeding. Now, federal habeas, as you allude to, is a whole other ball game, and that's certainly not. We certainly don't want to create doctrines no. that put more people there. <laughs> um, like 1983 is still a better place to be than there. Um, but uh, but yeah, but but I, but I hear your point. Well, I thought we could close um, in uh, talking about this this term that does kind. Of, I just find so mysterious that comes out of the um the opinion younger versus harris of our federalism and justice black capitalizes our federalism and i thought where does that there's no citation where does that come from so there's this there's this marvelous article maybe you've you've come come across it fred by um michael collins who's who's now at virginia but he wrote it a long time ago in the early 90s it was in constitutional commentary trying to figure out where this came from and it turns out that it was a it was a a pet phrase of Justice Frankfurter's for the entire time he was on the court and until late in his time, no other justices, virtually no other justices ever used it. And it kind of evolved in how he would use it. it when, when it started out, out, it seems like he used it as a almost like a noun, like instead of our federation, it was our federalism, very it, kind of innocuous use. It evolved. And then for some reason, it took on this term in Younger, and I'd love this sentence I'm going to read by Professor Collins. The reader of the opinion in Younger is therefore led to believe that the contours of state-federal relations evoked by the phrase, our federalism, are ones that were set in place long ago in some golden age of more modest national powers. Uh, when in fact, it was never used in the Supreme Court before Justice Frankfurter. And um, I looked on Google Books and it was used sporadically in the 19th century, but just kind of almost accidentally, I think. It didn't have, right, this pedigree um, until younger. Yeah, no, that that sounds, I mean, it's not surprising that 
would have been Justice Frankfurter, who probably used that phrase quite a bit in lower in lowercase, right? Lowercase o, lowercase f, <laughs> right, um, right. And uh, and yeah, and, I, and I've seen it in lowercase in the 1960s in uh, in exclusionary clause cases. You see it in cases like Map versus Ohio when they're trying to decide whether or not to apply the exclusionary clause to the states. You see, so you you see it in that context. But yeah, but I I'm not familiar with a lot of cases before Frankfurter. And and Frankfurter was the uh, uh, the the king of abstention <laughs> in the sense that he uh, he created um, he created Pullman abstention, um, which before younger abstention would have been kind of when you said abstention, that's what most people would have thought about. Um, and uh, and he was broadly reluctant to do things like interfere when it came to uh, gerrymandering, so the, you know one person one vote and the like. Um, he thought that that was tremendously invasive of, of federalism um, and. Um, he was a big. He he was fond of uh, adopting prudential norms and doctrines um, that um, that would that would stay the the federal court's hand, so to speak. Um, when, in his view, it would intrude on federalism interests. Um, so that's that's. Uh, I, so I, I will read that article on Michael Collins. Um, I'm actually going to be at UVA later this week for something. So oh, great. Well, we'll. We'll put a link to it uh, uh, up on the uh, on the website um, and on the uh, in the show notes. So you listeners, when you when you um, are looking on your app, we'll have a we'll have a link to that, and we'll of course put a link to um, Fred's article. And um, any any last words about younger? Do, do you want to say, when when younger is a hundred? Uh, are, are you thinking we'll have a very different conversation at that time? Let's hope so. <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I, I'll just say I'm really grateful that you're doing this, right? Because I, um, you know, it's it's hard to know what people's tolerance is to talk about these sorts of doctrines that, you know, they they impact people's lives in very real ways, um, and you know, when it comes to access to courts, um, these are the these are the types of doctrines that matter. Um, but you know, I. There's a lot of attention on other things like qualified immunity. Not not to say there shouldn't be, but it, but it's um, but this this was this is not one that has been that has captured the same sort of attention. Uh, you know, overturning Younger is not in the George Floyd uh, Justice uh, Act, for example. Um, and so, any conversation like this helps to elevate it. And so, I'm appreciative. Wonderful. Well, well, thanks again for coming on. Thank you, Sam, for coming up with the idea for this podcast uh, because well, it's definitely thanks. something. We should be talking say, about. Yeah, thank you for executing it, Anthony. Um, this was really interesting, and it was great to meet you, Professor. You as well. Thank you for your work. Thanks, everybody. And uh, we will see you next time for with a uh, more standard short circuit podcast. And I'd ask all of you um, to not abstain and instead to get engaged. Mm-hmm.